Previously on the West Wing Vlogs, the shit I forgot to talk about in the last episode. <laughs> so the pilot has a lot of things going for it, and before I get into uh, episode two, post hoc ergo proctor hoc, I thought I'd uh, go over a couple of things I forgot to get into detail about uh, in the pilot. So um, I mentioned last time that um, Mandy, the character who uh, is not part of the administration of the pilot, the outsider character, uh, would eventually leave the show when she's not really a very good fit, and I didn't really talk about her at all. Um, the thing you need to know about Mandy going into the show, uh, going into the first few episodes, is that uh, she used to work for the administration back when they were running for office, and that uh, her and Josh used to be an item. They used to date, and uh, they have a history together. So when she joins the show, it's another one of the things that I don't really like about that character, and that I think a lot of fans don't like about that character, is there's a bit of that we used to date um, kind of plot going on between Josh and Mandy. And the show is just better than those kind of stories. And honestly, the few times that it's brought up that Josh and Mandy used to date, it's really, it's just, it's useless information. It's like, why does that even matter? It's funny in this episode, episode two, to see Josh get so annoyed about uh, hiring his ex-girlfriend. But anyway, I forgot to mention that last time. And um, <laughs> I said she doesn't fit into the show and that it's apparent from her opening scene. In, the, in her introductory scene in the pilot, which is a show, like, the pilot is a really elegant show with these long steady cam shots and these righteous characters who are trying to do good, you know, despite the bumbling nature of their jobs. And then we meet this character, Mandy, with, like, 90s rock playing, driving in a convertible down Washington, D.C. You know, she's on a big-ass cell phone having a really awkward, obnoxious conversation where she's arrogant and rude, but not in a charming way. And she proceeds to get a uh, parking ticket. That scene is so jarring and out of place in the pilot it gives you an example, you know, an idea right away of why Mandy's no good. Uh, something else I didn't mention in the last episode, uh, and it's sort of a continuing plot. I mentioned that Sam sleeps with the call girl, who's played by Lisa Edelstein, by the way. Any of you House fans out there, she was uh, Cuddy, the hospital administrator in House. I mentioned that he sleeps with the call girl, but I forgot to mention that um, in addition to this being, you know, an obvious problem, if, should it leak out, that um, he ends up telling his boss, Leo, he ends up telling his boss's daughter, in a wonderful sequence in the pilot, uh, a big... A big moment, a big monologue moment, where Rob Lowe is trying to tell uh, Leo's Leo's daughter's third grade class. That's how it's set up. Sam's got to give a speech and talk to Leo's daughter's third grade class about uh, the Roosevelt Room. And he pulls the teacher outside at one point because he doesn't know anything about the Roosevelt Room. And he says, you know, gives this wonderful monologue where he says, you know, um, it's an awful day and... My boss crashes back into a tree, and my best friend's about to get fired for going on TV and making sense, and to make things worth, I accidentally slept with a prostitute last night. So would you please, for the love of all that is good in humanity, tell me which one of those little girls is Leo's daughter? <laughs> and she says, that would be me. Leo's daughter's third grade class. She's the teacher of the third graders. So, Leo's boss, uh, sorry, Leo's boss, Leo's boss is the president. Sam's boss, Leo, the, uh, the chief of staff, he, he might find out from uh, his daughter that... Sam has slept with a call girl. Also, there's going to be a bit of a continuing storyline there, because, of course, that's an excellent little meet-cute. And there'll be a bit of a romantic sort of kind of subplot for Rob Lowe and, um... What's her name? Madeline? It's not Madeline. Mallory, that's her name. Leo's daughter. So, uh, that's something I forgot to mention in the last episode. Um... That's pretty much it for what I talked about missed last episode. So now, into the new episode. Post-talk, ergo, proctor hawk. Uh, I got a lot of college-educated ed friends out there. I got a lot of heavy readers. Anybody know what postdoc ergo proctor hoc means? I certainly hope so if you watched the episode. One of my favorite lines in the show is when Josh says, uh, post, after it, uh, ergo, therefore, uh, after hoc, therefore, something else hoc. Uh, postdoc ergo proctor hoc means after it, therefore, because of it. Very funny scene where that line's brought up uh, where they're talking about the president's, uh, his sense of humor and the fact that he makes jokes uh, that don't always give him a lot of love, whether he's making fun of golfers or he's making fun of Texans or whatever. Um, obviously, the point of the episode is, uh, the point of the title has nothing to do with golf or a sense of humor, which leads me into a bit of a spoilerific conversation. I'm going to do my best in these videos to not spoil anything beyond where we are in the show, but uh, unlike last time talking about the pilot where I said I, I didn't want to spoil the president's introductory scene, um, in the individual videos I'm going to be spoiling the episodes themselves. So. I'll probably say it every time before I give anything important away, but spoilers for episode two, post hoc ergo proctor hoc. Uh, try and watch the episodes before you watch these videos, um, unless you don't care about spoilers. Um, so in this episode, the president has a lovely couple of scenes with uh, a military doctor, a Navy doctor, young black man. Young, he's like 30, 45, maybe, I don't know. Younger than the president, anyway. Um, and he goes in to give the president a little checkup, gives him a little flu shot, 
very fun conversation. He's got a new baby daughter at home. Um, they have an affinity together. It's clear the president, you know, feels at ease. He's a very likable character. And uh, uh, they talk about, you know, the Joint Chiefs and the Situation Room and the nature of the presidency, which is that you have to deal with being the Chief of Staff and the Commander-in-Chief of the military. And Bartlett, the President, says he doesn't really like violence very much, and more importantly, uh, and maybe more, you know, to the point, the Chairman's of the Joint Chiefs, they don't respect him. Every time he sits down in the Situation Room, it's clear that he doesn't have the, respects of, uh, the respect of those men. Um, he doesn't fe no one really thinks of him as a military leader. Um, at the end of the episode, um, his doctor, who, uh, you know, with the newborn daughter at home, he, um, he flies out of the country, he's in the military, he's going to go to a teaching school in the Middle East somewhere and, and help out for a week. Um, his plane is shot out of the air. It's a, you know, a cargo plane carrying other doctors. It's blown up by, um, insurgents. Uh, it's blown up by a rocket launcher. And they have to tell the president, who, you know, we've seen be... Very charming and very funny, but we, you know, we know he's not really a fan of violence or has any kind of militaristic uh, leanings. Um, he now is forced into a position where not only has someone close to him been killed, but there's been an attack against not only an American plane, but a medical American plane. So <laughs> that sets up another continuing storyline into the next episode, and it will eventually lead to my favorite line in the episode, which we'll talk about at the end of the video. Um, what else is going on in this episode is that... We, we meet the vice president for the first time. Um, we hear him mentioned as just that guy, or they say John, or they say Hoynes. We don't actually hear anyone refer to him as the vice president for a while. Um, he's played by Tim Matheson. Anybody who's a fan of Animal House will recognize him. He was Otter in Animal House. Um, the story, which you'll get to, you know, you'll find out later, is that they probably wouldn't have gotten elected without choosing him as a vice president, because he brought a big southern vote. He was, you know, he was kind of the front runner before President Bartlett got involved. But that's all down the line. What you need to know about this episode is um, there is not, they don't have the best relationship, the president and the vice president. Um, and the president doesn't see him as a valuable member of the team, which is why he's not a regular cast member. And the vice president looks, as, looks at the president as kind of like a bullying school teacher or an abusive step parent or something like that, like putting him in a corner, ignoring his work. So in this episode, there's a press conference. We get to see the press room for the first time. Alice and Janney and C.J. Craig, get to see, we get to see her in her press room. A much smaller version of what will eventually become a way better press room. And somebody asks her, uh, regarding you know, a piece of legislation or whatever, the vice president was quoted as saying, this is a time when the president needs our support. Which obviously is not something that should be said by the vice president. Come on. No, we, no the president doesn't need our support. He's our leader. You know, the vice president is not in charge, blah, blah. So um, that's a continuing storyline that will go on for years of uh, the, um, the, the soft, uneasy alliance between the president and the vice president. What exactly happened between them? Why do they have this rift? And there's a fantastic scene towards the end of the episode with Leo, uh, Bartlett's best friend and chief of staff, sitting down with the vice president to talk about the fact that he does not go on national television and say the president needs our support. He does not ignore directives from you know, C.J. Craig, the press secretary. Um, it's also interesting to note that you'll, it'll become a recurring thing throughout the series. Anytime anyone refers to the President Bartlett as Bartlett or Jed or that guy or anything else, our characters say, he's the President. Refer to him as the President. They never call him Jed. Um, only his wife, the First Lady, will call him Jed. I think Leo might do it once. Um, they don't have any such respect for the Vice President. You know, only to his face do they call him Mr. Vice President. And Leo continually calls him John by his first name in a very colloquial, familiar way. So not a lot of respect for this character. And he does eventually, you know, he's not a villain. He does eventually get some dignity and some wonderful moments. But that scene with, uh, with Leo and the vice president with Hoynes is fantastic. I love the moment where, you know, the vice president says, I've just about had it with you and your buddy. And Leo's like, excuse me, my buddy? You're referring to the president? Refer to him as the president, you dick. <laughs> um... So there's a lot of good stuff in here. There's plenty of uh, humor. Mandy, <laughs> Mandy, in her in the opening scene of this episode, it's so again, it's so jarring. Mandy opens the episode again with crappy '90s rock, and she's driving her convertible down Washington, and she jumps her car over the curb and has a screaming match in public with uh, the person that she was working with in the last episode, Lloyd Russell. She at one point threatens him with her shoe. Just really like, what is this? Let's get back to the real characters. But what happened is uh, Josh, you know, uh, fucked up her, her, her boss's bid for presidency. So she's been fired, you know, which means she's out of a job. And because of all this stuff in the press about making fun of golfers and the, the vice president saying some shit about, the, you know, the president needing our support and, you know, making fun of Texans, it's clear that we need, a, you know, the, the, the administration thinks they need a, uh, a media liaison, someone to come in and kind of 
help direct the message and keep the stupid shit out of the uh, out of the office. So they hire Mandy, much to Josh's chagrin. Um, everybody kind of teams up on him, gangs up on him, and says, we're going to hire Mandy. And there's a funny recurring bit where Josh says, all right, we'll hire her, but she needs to understand that she answers to me, and she answers to Toby. Um, so she gets, she gets, she's hired, she joins the staff, um, she punches him in the arm. That's what's going on this episode. Also, Sam uh, tells Josh and Leo that he slept with a call girl. <laughs> Accidentally. Um... I'm sorry, he doesn't tell Leo. Josh and Toby. Sam tells Josh and Toby that he's up with the con girl. Uh, Josh being one of his best friends, they've been friends for years. And um, Toby is his boss and also kind of an older brother parental figure. Uh, Toby's the speechwriter, the head speechwriter, communications director. Sam is the deputy. They write the speeches together. Um, and Toby is the, the very... They're all idealistic, but Toby is, is very self-righteous and pompous at times. He's kind of prickly. And um, he, his sense of humor is a lot more biting. He doesn't, he doesn't laugh very often. He often says things that make people laugh because he's got a very, you know, small, short, <laughs> short fuse when it comes to stupid knucklehead problems. Like, he has a wonderful line in this episode uh, where he says, you know, we don't even need a, um, oh God, what's the line? We don't even need a, um, we don't even need an attack party. We do just fine by ourselves. Not an attack party. I'm messing up Aaron Sorkin dialogue. You have to know how embarrassed I am. Um, we don't even need an opposition party. We do fine by ourselves. Um, there's a great moment where Sam tells Toby, his boss, uh, by the way, I accidentally slept with a call girl. And he's like, I don't understand. Did you trip over something? <laughs> so that's continuing as well. The, the Sam sleeps with the call girl subplot. What else here? I got my little notes. Because there's a lot that goes on in these 40-minute episodes. Um, do 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 <laughs> Watch me read notes. Welcome to the new West Wing series. Um, that's pretty much it, I guess, for the continuing storylines. Um, CJ still hasn't had a lot to do in terms of like leading a storyline. She has more to do this time because she's the first person to interact with the vice president. And their relationship becomes really interesting later on as well. Um, in terms of the specs for this episode, it was once again directed by the great Tommy Schlamme, director of the pilot, and once again written by uh, the fantastic Aaron Sorkin. Um, in terms of my favorite line of the episode, um, as I said, the episode sets up the fact that the president is a very intelligent man, he's a very likable man. Um, there's a line that Morris Tulliver, the doctor who gets blown up, he says to the president at one point, Sir, you've got a once-in-a-generation mind. That's something that's said uh, way, way later at the end of season two by a completely different character. So it's clear this president is brilliant, he won a Pulitzer Prize, um, or not a Pulitzer, he won a Nobel Prize. He's very charming, he's likable, um, you know, he thinks he's very funny, but sometimes the shit he said gets him in trouble. But he's not, you know, he's very liberal, he's Catholic, he's not into violence, he doesn't understand violence. He says at one point, you know, I understand our country has enemies, but I don't feel violence towards any of them. Um, so at the end of the episode, at three in the morning, he's woken up and pulled back into the Oval Office wearing a sweatshirt. Always interesting and, and a little bit um, unsettling to see the president in the Oval Office, not in a suit, but because things are going crazy in the middle of the night. And Leo comes to him and says, Sir, Morris Tulliver um, has been killed. His plane was shot out of the sky by a rocket launcher. Um, we thought it might have been a mechanical failure, but no, a fundamentalist, um, you know, insurgent group um, has, has taken credit for it. There's been an attack and Morris has been killed. And the president's very visibly shaken up, but not like... He doesn't get the jitters, he doesn't start crying, just very quietly, you know, this character we've seen making lots of quips and jokes is very quietly looking down and saying, okay, do we have this, do we have that, you know, where's the, the leader of that country on the phone? Just very quietly getting things in order. And uh, Leo says, all right, sir, and starts to leave. And uh, the president calls him back and says, the last line of the episode, which is my favorite in this episode, he says, uh, he goes, Leo. Leo turns back and the president says, I'm not afraid. Yeah, wait, no. Mm. Yeah, sorry, my shitty handwriting. He goes, I am not afraid. I'm going to blow them off the face of the earth with God's own thunder. Get the commanders. Very fucking badass line. It's the first time we get to see somebody, uh, especially particularly the president, speak with that, you know, the, uh, that kind of authority. Um, it's a great little cliffhanger. As I said, this is not a show that we do, you know, individual storylines for one episode. Things continue on. So um, for those of you who are big Game of Thrones fans and you're like, man, and they just kill people on that show all the time, get used to it in the Aaron Sorkin series as well. Uh, people die on the West Wing. It's pretty brutal. If you really like somebody, be careful. They might be killed. It's obviously not as bad as Game of Thrones, where like half the characters get their fucking heads cut off before they get raped, before they get thrown into a fire. But <laughs> a lot of people do die in this show. This is the first time where, you know, Aaron introduces us to a very likable character with a brand new baby girl at home. He's got a very sweet scene with the president. He's very likable. We think he's going to become a recurring character on the show, but instead he's blown out of the sky, um, and the president finally 
finds it within himself to feel some righteous anger um, towards these enemies of you know of America because they blew his friend up. And that will be the main storyline in the next episode, a proportional response. Um, the big thing going on next episode will be how the president and the United States is dealing with this attack. Um, this first time, next, I mean, I'll get into it more next time, but uh, we'll be seeing the, the, the situation for the first time. We'll be meeting the, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. A lot of good shit will be going on in the next episode. So that's pretty much all for this episode, unless I forgot something, in which case I'll do another previously on to open up the next episode. Um, like I said, I fucking love the West Wing. For you guys out there watching it for the first time, I hope you enjoyed the second episode. Um, I hope you're liking our cast. Uh, next episode sees the introduction of a new cast member who will be joining the opening credits, so I'm very excited about that. For those of you watching or uh, listening to uh, West Wing Weekly, the podcast, um, Dulé Hill is the new actor who will be joining the show, and I'll talk about it more next time, but he's on that podcast uh, for that episode. So, thank you as always. Uh, check me out at uh, Facebook. My name is George Efta. Uh, find me on Twitter, at George Efta. Uh, I got a blog, all that good stuff. I'll try and remember to put all the links in the description below. And uh, I'll see you next time on the West Wing vlogs.